Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship here at St. John's. My name is Tom. I am the pastor here. And if you're joining us in person, if you're joining us online for this first Sunday in the season of Advent, we want to especially welcome you. We're so glad you're here. Welcome back, all the hunters. Um, a couple of you, uh, we were talking before the service. Um, and so grateful for your return safely. Um, if it's your first time worshiping with us, if you could um, consider filling out what we call the Connect card. It's right in your pew. Um, if you fill that out um, or online, you can fill it out digitally at the link there on the screen. Let us know that you're here so that we can thank you for worshiping with us. We're so grateful uh, that you have decided to join us this morning. Um, if you'd like to give an offering as an act of worship, we welcome and encourage you to consider doing that, um, especially at the end of the year, those offerings are so very important to help us um, to have the resources that we need to do the things that God has called us to do. And as we say each and every week, when we give an offering, it's an act of worship. Everything we have is God's. And we take a portion of what God has given us and we give it back as a thank offering, but also as a trust offering, believing that he is going to continue to provide for our needs. And so you can give online at the information there on the screen. You can also give by leaving your offering in the box as you exit the sanctuary. Uh, we have a number of opportunities to celebrate this season of anticipating Christmas and Jesus' return. Um, the first one offering related is our Christmas giving tree, and we welcome you to consider giving to a family in need in our community or in Kenya this year. We partner each and every year with the Walworth County Health and Human Services Department to be connected with families through foster care. Um, we also connect with Safe Families and our Kenya Mission team. And there are over a hundred different ornaments out on the tree each and every year. We receive those names and we look at the list and we go, only God could meet all of these needs. And he always does um, because of you, because you have been so very generous in years past. And if you feel led to be a part of that this year, I want to encourage you to check out the tree as you exit. You can take an ornament. Make sure to sign it out so that we know where it went. Um, and if you'd like to sign up later, you can do that online. All of those gifts are listed there as well. Um, take a look at your bulletin. There's a couple of things I want to point out as well as we get into this season of Advent and looking forward to Christmas Eve. Um, we have our Generations Meal and Gathering where the Silver Tones group, uh, Jan Ellsworth, their fearless leader, if you want to put your hand up, um, can answer questions about the performance that will be taking place. Their Christmas performance where we'll be singing Christmas carols, hearing the Christmas story, and then Annie's Catering is going to be catering lunch. And if you're available to make that on Tuesday, December 6th, that will be at 11 a.m. Um, we'll begin here in the sanctuary and we'll end with our meal in the fellowship hall. So be sure to join us for that. Um, be mindful that on Sunday, December 18th, is our kids' Christmas program, Jingle Jam. And as we do each and every year, we combine all the services into one so that we can all experience Christmas through the eyes of a child. Each and every year, it's a fresh program. And um, this year looks really really exciting. Um, I, I am excited. My kids are excited. Um, they're so excited about all the things that are going on right now around the holidays. My son Carlos wasn't able to come to Thanksgiving Eve worship this last week. He got up the next morning, woke me up in bed, and he said, is it Sunday yet? Because he wanted to go back to church. It's how much fun it is. And so I um, want to encourage you to have a taste of that that Sunday, but also be mindful that we will not have an 8 or a 1045 service service that morning because of that. And then, of course, our Christmas Eve services are going to this year be, we've got three different opportunities to worship. On Christmas Eve itself, December 
24th. Our services are going to be at 2 and 4 o'clock. And we also have a Christmas on the Square service. Um, we did this two years ago um, in 2020, and so many people found it to be such a meaningful thing, though we're hoping it's not like 30 degrees below zero. Uh, did anybody here join us for that two years ago? Many of you did. I think we got t-shirts, right? <laughs> Actually, sweaters would have made more sense. And so we're hopeful that that's not what it's going to be like this year, but we are hopeful that all of the magic of that night is going to be a part of it, and it will. And so we're going to do that at 6 o'clock on December 21st, the Wednesday before. It's a great opportunity if you have plans to be with family out of town for Christmas Eve. Um, we'll be singing Christmas carols. We'll have an abridged Christmas message, and we will end with candlelight, silent night, and hot chocolate at Friends on the Square, which is right across the street. Um, I'm told that it is like a Hallmark Christmas movie. I say I'm told because I don't watch Hallmark Christmas movies, but I do like to make fun of them. So, so anyway, I apologize. I've offended some of you, and I haven't even gotten through the announcements. So I'll stop right now. Um, we would love for you to be a part of it and um, for you to take note of all those opportunities to worship. Right now, as we have gathered, we are here to worship. And we begin in a moment of silence, and we're going to come out of this moment of silence being reminded that today in the first Sunday of Advent is a focus on hope, the hope that Jesus came to bring and the hope that his return brings to us today. Let God right now allow us to be in his presence. Be still. God, you threw the whole world a curveball when you showed us a kind of hope we'd never thought to look for. Born of poverty between the walls of a rickety barn and into the fragile arms of a nervous young mom, Jesus arrived unable to defend himself, much less anyone else. We'd been hoping for security and you gave us a baby. And then, the expectations kept being shattered. Jesus healed those who could do nothing for him. He handed out hope to people the world turned away. Jesus showed us a new way of life. A life that works from the inside out. Hope lives with us, then inside us, and moves from our hearts into the world. Jesus gave us hope beyond this life. Hope no one else has to give. Hope that shows up in a manger as a gift we don't deserve, but we gratefully receive. We call him Jesus. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. At this time, I invite you to stand as we begin worship in the name of our God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and in the presence of one another. Gracious God, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Forgive us and give us strength to turn from sin, and to serve you in newness of life. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you and for me, and for his sake, God forgives all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he become, we become children of God, and he bestows on us the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, let us continue in worship as we profess the words of our faith. In the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. 
He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we continue in worship. Lord God, we come before you this morning in worship. We thank and praise you that you are present with us and that we have the privilege of being invited into your presence because you came to be with us. As we are seated, we pray that you prepare our hearts to hear your word, that it might speak your truth, that we might become more like you when we leave than when we came. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we open up God's word, I want to praise God um, for Jennifer's son on um, the organ. What a beautiful gift that we had this morning. And also Marty, who has um, had some challenges in the last several weeks. And this is your first Sunday back in, in quite some time. And so can we praise God for our musicians this morning? Um, I also, before we open up God's word, I want to invite you, we're opening it up together, so turn to the people around you and say good morning and take out your Bible. As you're seated again, I encourage you to take out your Bible, open it up to Luke chapter 1. As I share almost every Sunday, if you don't have a Bible, take it out with you. I know one of my earliest memories coming to faith myself 
um, was around the season of Christmas and reading the Christmas story in its entirety. And we're going to do that starting this morning. We're going to be in the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 5 through 23. I'm going to read verses 5 through 10. And then the following verses, uh, 11 through 23, we're going to watch in a video to help us kind of immerse ourselves in the story of the preparation for Christmas. And so let's begin in verse 5 of chapter 1 of Luke's Gospel. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Let's continue our reading as we watch. opening your mouth, not saying a word. I'm talking complete silence. God was for over 400 years. The muteness from the creator of the universe. The one who said that earth is but a footstool to him was about to break his silence. shall name him John. A son? You will have great joy, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He will turn many to the Lord their God. He will come with the power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children. But, but I'm an old man. My wife... I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. And it was he who sent me to give you this good news. You will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born, for what he has spoke will surely be fulfilled.
It begins. The ritual becomes radiant, and the faithful become fathers. When God speaks, the heavens rise and the earth bows. Hope grows where hurt was rooted. Time becomes eternity. And he leads us to holy ground that was once hollow. Yes, my friends, God is just getting started. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When God tells you the impossible is going to happen, how do you respond? When God tells you the impossible, and I don't, I don't mean like walking through walls, as cool as that would be, but is there something in your life that feels impossible, a weight that feels impossible to have lifted? What if God decided this morning to wake you up, to shake you alert, to tell you this morning that something extraordinary is going to take place in your life, how would you react if it were true? Because that's the situation that we have in our reading today in Zechariah. That is the question that we begin in the season of Advent. Today is the first Sunday in Advent. It's the beginning of the church calendar. It's a beginning of a new year. It's a season of anticipating not just the coming of Jesus on Christmas, but his return as he has promised that he will come back. And our theme this year is a weary world rejoices because it doesn't take very long to look around and see just how weary some places in our world are right now. And if I could have picked, I was thinking about this, looking back at what I know now over the last several years, um, themes for Advent. Um, these are the ones that I would pick. You can tell me um, how you feel about them. You might have different words that you would use to describe. Um, 2019, I'd probably say a naive world rejoices. Does that sound accurate? We did not know what we did not know as far as what was about to come into the world. 2020, a blindsided world rejoices we were trying to figure it out 2021 an emerging world rejoices and then 2022 a weary world rejoices we didn't know what we didn't know back in 2019 and today we know so much more there's so much change so much pain so much suffering, so much trauma in our world. Actually, trauma is the word that psychologists and pastors alike have referred to what we've been through collectively as a world society, collective trauma. Whether you've lost a loved one through death, or whether you have lost relationships through the divisions of our society as it rages on politics and culture, we have all been through an extraordinary season, and in almost every regard, it's far from over. <laughs> Mass shootings, inflation, the threat of world war. I was, I was telling my wife, Alyssa, back in, in March of 2020, one of the first things I did in those first couple of weeks as things were so quickly changing is there were these Zoom meetings with pastors from places in Europe and in China, and they were talking about the way that the beginnings of the pandemic were hitting these communities that were, were kind of a little bit ahead of where we were as a nation at that point. And so it was, it was really fascinating and sobering to sit and to listen to the way in which things were changing and people were getting sick and all of those things. It was like, I, I describe it like, like watching, and you could appreciate this watching the news. It was, it was really communicated to us like a hurricane. It would be like watching a hurricane on the news knowing that your community is in its path and it's coming for you. And, and so we, we watch these things, and then, as you know, if you live in this particular area, it didn't quite hit places 
like Elkhorn in the same way that it hit places like New York City, for example. And, and looking back, I'm, I'm so grateful for that because that wasn't the case for everyone. And it did hit all of us in some way, shape, or form. And it's still hitting us in some way, shape, or form. Today, I believe that it's in the form of exhaustion and confusion and weariness and depression. Our world is weary. And so I was telling Alyssa, I feel like what we're experiencing right now is what I was being told to prepare for back in March of 2020. We're experiencing the effects of the collective trauma today. And a weary world needs something. A weary world needs someone to rejoice in. We need to know that the impossible is possible. And so I think it is the perfect time to talk about Christmas. It's hard to imagine 2,000 years ago, but Jesus was born in what would have been considered the definition of what would have been considered impossible. We take it for granted today because we celebrate it each and every year. And, and not unlike a Zoom call telling us what is to come, angels came and they foretold not the coming storm, but they foretold the coming hope. And next week, we're going to learn about the angel Gabriel telling Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 29, a little bit later, that she would be blessed. Verse 30 and 31 says that the angel will tell her, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Now, she has a question, just like Zechariah has a question, right? She says, how can this be? I am a virgin. And the angel explains it's going to be the work of God, and her response is beautiful. She says, I am the Lord's servant. And I want you to hold that example, and we're going to compare and contrast it to the one that we're talking about today, answering the question, when God tells you the impossible is possible, and it's going to happen. How do you respond? As we look at Zechariah, let's read a portion of what we just watched in the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 11, the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. When God tells you the impossible is going to happen, how do you respond? The, the first response we see both in the response of Mary and in the response of Zechariah is we see the response of fear. We see the response of fear. If an angel appeared to you today and told you that you would bear a son that you would bear a child, and the biological requirements were not present, whether it be virginity or age, would you be afraid? <laughs> Some of you are a little afraid right now. <laughs> like, it's, how possible is this, Pastor Tom? W wouldn't you be afraid, first of all, of a power that is, is great enough to tell you that this is so through an angel, but also a power that is powerful enough to actually make it Happen. It reminds me of a quote by C.S. Lewis. I've shared this during Advent before. He, he just passed away 1963 on November 22nd. Last week we celebrated his life. And the quote that I think about during this time is, is from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. If you remember, how many of you remember that story, show of hands? Um, it's just a wonderful, wonderful story. And Jesus in the story is portrayed as a lion. His, his name is Aslan. And in this dialogue, there's a child, her name is Susan, and she's talking to the character Mr. Beaver, and she, she hasn't met Aslan yet. She has not met the lion, and so he explains to her, he says, Aslan is a lion, the lion, a great lion, and she says, ooh, I thought he was a man. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Would you feel nervous about meeting a lion? You're like Susan, right? He says, safe? You want to know if this lion is safe? Mr. Beaver asks, who said anything about being safe? Of course, he isn't safe, but he's good. He's good. He's the king, I tell you. 
Folks, there's nothing safe about a God who has such control over his creation that at the snap of his fingers, he can part the sea, he can flood the planet, he can make life out of dust and dust out of nothing. He can harden the hearts of rulers. That by the movement of his spirit, he can come through the womb of a virgin. That through the miracle of his hand, he can cause a couple like Zechariah and Elizabeth to conceive a child in their old age. Being afraid would be a natural response. And it's one that both Mary and Zechariah express. It is not sinful. It is not wrong. If you were not afraid in the circumstances they find themselves in, that would be a cause for concern. Anybody would be afraid in what they are experiencing, which tells us that those who don't respect or even fear the power of God may never get to the next step of seeing the impossible become possible in our lives. Because once you fear the power of God, the next response that God tells us is, he tells us that the impossible is going to happen is that you believe. You fear the power of God and then you believe that what he says can be true, will be true. But here's the thing, even if you don't believe it, God is a lion. God is a lion and he is powerful and he is mighty and if all of it is true, his will will be done whether you believe it or not. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. And Christmas Eve, a number of years ago, I shared that Christmas is really a divine interruption, isn't it? It's a divine interruption, like, like holiday parties and Christmas gatherings and presents interrupt our budgets and our busy schedules. I mean, we all still have to do all the same things we normally have to do this time of year, right? And then we add all of these interruptions at the same time. They break up our regular routine. And in the same way, in a much bigger sense, God did the same thing. He did not wait to send his son Jesus Jesus in a time that was convenient to the world. He interrupted the world. It was not a well-rested world. It was not a sinless world. It was a world that was broken and weary. For Mary, this came as an interruption to her engagement with Joseph. For Zechariah, God interrupted his job in the temple. God also interrupted his retirement. <laughs> By giving him a child. Can you imagine? Some of you can. You've taken care of grandchildren. You've, you've had children later on in life. You might be able to imagine a little bit of what this was like. The impossible became possible for both of them. And this is where their, their response to the impossible diverges between Mary, what we're going to learn next week. She believed that God's will would be done. She believed that it would happen. But Zechariah had some questions. Zechariah was more like you and me. He was afraid. He believed in God, but he questioned whether or not the impossible really was possible in him. And I would love to think that I would be much more like Mary, but the truth is I am more often more like Zechariah. And so I love how God responds through the angel Gabriel to Zechariah's questions in verse 19. It says this, The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. Remember that from the video? This boom booming voice. Imagine that. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and you will not be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Notice in, in both the story of Zechariah and what we will see next week in the story of Mary, God is going to do what God is going to do. God is a lion and his plans and his will are not contingent upon our feelings. And that should be good news to you and me who believe that he is good because it tells us that your weariness is no match for God's goodness. It doesn't matter how exhausted you are doesn't matter what questions you have. It doesn't matter what place in life that you're in or how much God's presence coming into your world right now is an interruption. Your weariness is no match for the goodness of God. And we see this tangibly in two different ways in the life of Zechariah. The first one is this. 
Just because Zechariah doesn't believe that what God is saying is going to happen is true doesn't mean that God is not going to make it happen anyway. John is still going to come. His wife has still conceived. But the second way we see God's grace in the midst of questions, and I love this one, is, is God is even willing to change our circumstances so that we have a better chance of believing. In Zechariah's case, this means that that God is going to make him silent until the baby is born so that he can hear the good news of God. And that truth has been the root of countless jokes. Wives who wish the angel Gabriel would come to their husbands during their pregnancy and make them silent too. God did this, and for Zechariah, it was a gift. Because he needed to be quiet in order to be able to hear the voice of God speak. And I know this because it's a gift for me too that sometimes I receive. I don't think it's God doing it. I do it myself. How many people get sick after the rat race of the holidays? Show of hands. Has that ever happened to you? Uh, a lot of people, that it, it happens a lot. You get through everything. The adrenaline rush starts to, to, to die down and suddenly you have a cold. <laughs> Or you have the flu and you have to stay put. It's not God that's making us silent, but, but God speaks in the silence. It doesn't just happen physically. I remember a number of years ago, I was sitting in the office of my counselor and I was feeling very weary, depressed would have been the word that I would have used to describe it. And, and I felt like there was something wrong with me for feeling that way. Because pastors shouldn't feel that way, right? <laughs> right? I'm supposed to be excited. I'm supposed to be hope-filled. And I was not feeling excited. And I was not feeling hope-filled. And my counselor helped me see that just like we can get physically weary or even sick after a crazy and difficult season in life, we can become mentally and emotionally weary and even get depressed after a particularly difficult season in life. And I had been going through a very difficult season in life. And I was weary. And in the middle of that, I was beating myself up for being weary. (laughs) As if there was something wrong with me. And my counselor reminded me, and I will never forget this. He said, Tom, to be weary is to be human. To be weary is to be human. And and maybe you needed to hear that this morning. Because I needed to hear that. And I need to hear that over and over again. There is nothing wrong with you. Sometimes to be depressed is normal. And I don't say that to suggest that that means that we shouldn't therefore reach out. I'm telling you, I was sitting in a counselor's office. We should reach out for help. And sometimes our depression is deeper than our circumstantial weariness, but sometimes it isn't. And in the story of Zechariah, it reminds me that when those seasons come, whether they're circumstantial or whether they are the touch of God literally silencing us, God's grace is that when we are quiet, we can hear his voice if we will just spend the time to listen. And I know that nobody wants to get sick. Nobody wants to get weary. Nobody wants to get depressed or mute so that they can slow down and listen to God's voice. But I also know a lot of people, and there's probably a number of us in this room, that don't slow down until we get sick, do we? We don't stop until we have to. I know people, because I go and visit, right? If you go to the hospital and you call in, I'll come visit you in the hospital. And I've talked to so many people who have found God in a hospital bed recovering from a procedure or a situation because recovering is the longest time they've actually sat in one place in years and actually listened to the voice of God in as long as they can remember. Well, the promise of God and and the gift that he gives Zechariah here is that he actually touches him with silence before that very thing happens. Not through illness or depression, but it's a temporarily incapacitated state of his vocal cords. And because he can't speak, he listens. 
And because he listens, he hears the voice of God speaking this gift of faith into his heart. And it carries him to a place where he fears the presence of God and he believes that the impossible can be possible and it will be. He experiences what the apostle Peter later writes in 2 Peter chapter 3 who says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but every Everyone to come to repentance. And so the question this Advent is, are you waiting for God to act in a miraculous way in your life? Are you waiting for God to do something that seems downright impossible? Listen for his voice, and if he has not yet answered your prayer, the promise of Christmas is that he is not finished yet. And so we fast forward in the story, months of being a silent Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, they finally welcome their son John. And it says this in verse 59, on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child and they were going to name him after his father Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, his name is to be called John. Remember, that's what the angel said they were to name him. And verse 61 says that they questioned her. They said, there's no one among your relatives who has that name. And so they made signs to the father, right? Because he cannot yet speak. What do you want to name the child? He asked for a writing tablet. And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is, say it with me, John. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was set free. And what did he use that tongue to speak? He began to speak praising God. When God tells you the impossible is going to happen, how do you respond? You fear the power of a God who can. You believe that what he says is true and then you rejoice. You rejoice because he will. After being silent for months, the first words out of Zechariah's mouth are a song. Not just rejoicing in what God has done in his life, but what God will do. It's, there's actually, it's, it's called the Benedictus, which in, is, is Latin, and, and, and it's Latin for praise be. It's right there in the Gospel of Luke. And, and Mary has a song too, right? And, and, and her song, it, it's, it means my, my soul magnifies the Lord. Mary's song is like a psalm, right? Praising God. Zechariah's song has always been known more as prophetic. It, it actually speaks to the future. And so I want to I read some of this to you because what it means is that as, as God has brought into the world John, Zechariah's response to this miracle is not just to thank God for the miracle, but to see that if this one miracle can happen, then what can't happen in God? What isn't possible? Look at all that God is going to do. And so he begins this song, verse 68. He says, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. See, God has promised for thousands of years to redeem his people. And even though the Redeemer Jesus is still growing in his mother Mary's womb, God promises, his promises are as good as done in the eyes of those who have seen the impossible become possible in the birth of John. And so Zechariah continues this song. He says, he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of those who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. Zechariah had confidence that all of these things that have been promised for generations before will happen. And he has confidence in this when his own son is only eight days old. This miracle has given him hope for the future. In the same way the miracle of Christmas should give you and I hope for the impossible in our lives as well. And you could appreciate this. Anybody who's held a child who's just been born, you know the feeling. 
It's why parents of newborn children often don't take their kids out in public. Why? Because everybody wants to touch your child, right? Everybody wants to touch an infant child. Well, the reason why is because people are drawn. It's indescribable. They're drawn to an infant because an infant is hope personified. An infant is is hope in all of the possibilities of the future in this tiny little package with a tiny little heart beating, this miracle of life that is just beginning. And the same was true for Zechariah, and even more so because of what John represents. Verse 76 in his song, he says, You, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will come before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into a path of peace. I want to bring you back to the question I asked you at the very beginning. If God decided to shake you up this morning during church, to wake you, to make you alert, to tell you that something extraordinary is about to take place in your life, how would you respond? Because these are the things, these are the things, the impossible things that God says will happen to you, and it is what happened on Christmas. This Christmas, do you need the knowledge that that you're saved from your enemies? That knowledge is here in the promise of Christmas. Even the enemies that seem so strong and mighty, maybe your enemy isn't a person, maybe it's a habit, maybe it's an addiction, maybe it's a sin, maybe it's a darkness that you've been living under for so long that it seems impossible that God could ever lift you from it, forgive you from it, take it away from you. You know what else is impossible? Virgin birth. You know what else is impossible? Having a baby when you're old enough to have been claiming social security for a number of years. (laughs) And yet God did both of those things. And you think that your sin, the thing you come to church and pray for each and every week, you think that thing is too much for him? You feel the harshness of a world that needs the tender mercy of God? Do you long for light in darkness? Are you looking for a miracle that says that when you die, you actually will live in heaven forever with God and with your loved ones who he has drawn near to him? And that that is not something that is just an image, but that is a literal truth that God came by sending his son to bring down to us. Friends, these are are the impossible things that God sent Jesus to accomplish. And he tells us through his word. And he tells us through the testimony of the spirit inside of us that not only will they happen, but in Jesus, they are already here. And it leaves you and me with the question that was left with Zechariah and with Mary at the beginning. When God tells you that the impossible is going to happen, how do you respond You fear the power of a God who can. You believe in the power of a God that what he says will take place is true. And you rejoice, especially a weary world, knowing that he has and he already will. Let's pray these things, that these truths might take hold of our hearts on this first Sunday in Advent. Lord Jesus, we thank and praise you that the impossible has already taken place, that it has already happened, and it happened 2,000 years ago when you came, and you will return. You are God with us. You came to be present with us. You are in us. And just like the angel Gabriel spoke truth to Zechariah in the temple, we know that now the temple is us. It is our hearts. Your spirit dwells inside of us, whispering into our weary hearts and minds and souls, I am here. I am with you. Come to me. For all of us here this morning, who are weary, help us to hear the words of truth that to be weary is to be human. 
no matter what our circumstances are that we have faced over the last three years, we have all been through a collective trauma and change. We will forever look back at this season as a moment where we needed your voice, where we still need your voice today, where we need to know that the impossible is possible and can be found in you, and it can because you came to us. Help us to prepare. Help us as we pray to know that the prayers that have yet to be answered are prayers that you are still working on because you are not finished yet. And you promise to give us hope. Hope that Hebrews 11.1 1 states, and I think I've quoted it a thousand times just this week, that faith, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. We live in this time of what is and what will be. You have come and you will return and you live in us. And you are with us. And your promise to be with us comes to us through this meal that you have given us. 2,000 years ago, Jesus, as he grew to become a man, and he chose to allow himself to die, that he might make the impossible possible for you and me, eternal salvation. As we open our eyes, we remember that Jesus took bread with the disciples and he takes it in his presence with us and he broke it. And he said, take and eat, this is my body broken for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you eat this, remember me. After the supper, Jesus took the cup of blessing, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink and said, take and drink this cup. It's the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, remember me. For as often as we eat this bread and as often as we drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. If you believe that to be true, if you believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that he is no longer hanging on that tree because he is dwelling in your heart and he will return to take you to be with him where he has gone to the place where he is going, where he has prepared a way. If you believe those things to be true and you desire to be comforted by his presence and grace, even now, no matter what your background, no matter who you are, where you've been, or where you're going, you are welcome because God welcomes you. The only way in which we can receive this gift of God's grace and hope this morning is to open up our hands as a physical sign of surrender as we pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, as our usher comes forward to dismiss you by row, come, come to the table.